So yes, my name is Eva Lievens. I'm um, uh, leading the research group Law and Technology at um, Ghent University, the Faculty of Law and Criminology. And so in the next, um, next half an hour, I would like to talk to you about um, how children um, increasingly gr grow up in an environment um, that is um, permeated with AI applications. And I would like to talk both about the positive impact of such AI applications on children and the risks that these applications may have. Um, I will also try to show you that um, the way in which these technologies are present in children's lives affects their rights, their children's rights, as uh, are laid down in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I will also briefly look at some legislative initiatives in this area so that you know a little bit more about what is going on, how policymakers think about how we should approach these AI applications in respect of children. And actually, um, we are doing a lot of research in our research group on uh, the impact of digital technologies on children. And what we see is that in many policy documents, there is always this emphasis on the fact that children's lives are really reshaped by how technologies um, are present in their day-to-day -day reality. And the fact that this is um, that there are two sides of the coin. Many of these technologies really benefit children, um, give them a lot of opportunities that they um, uh, also themselves think are very important. But at the same time, there are also some risks that we need to be aware of, and both as um, uh, as parents, uh, but also as uh, citizens who are thinking critically about these developments. Um, I will give you a few examples of um, how uh, children uh, are uh, confronted with AI applications and how this can uh, change their lives, both positively and negatively. I think one of the most important and most known examples is the fact that um, uh, AI can lead to very, very um, positive developments and um, uh, benefits in the area of health. Uh, so um, AI applications can lead to better diagnosis also um, in the area of pediatrics. And so diseases um, that children may have can be diagnosed um, better and faster. And this can of course have um, a very positive effect on their, um, on their uh, right to health. A second uh, context in which AI is present in children's lives is the educational context. Uh, on the screen, you see a picture of um, how education happened during COVID. Uh, so I think this is something that uh, we are all familiar with uh, in our professional lives, but also children spend a lot of time in front of their laptop, especially during times when schools were closed due to lockdowns. And so digital technology has been very important um, during the pandemic to make sure that children could still um, learn and could still uh, be in contact with the school. But at the same time, we also see that in this educational context, for instance, um, the learning platforms that children use um, are um, uh, tracing a lot of uh, data. Uh, this data about children's performance at school can be used for uh, positive um, uses, such as uh, the personalization of learning tra tra trajectories uh, or um, personalized um, solutions for certain learning difficulties. So, so this can definitely be uh, of benefit, but at the same time, uh, um, if this type of data about performance is uh, kept and stored for a long time and perhaps later used to give children access to higher education, to allow them entry into universities. Uh, this can uh, be also something that we need to be um, a little bit mindful and careful um, uh, about. 
Um, so in the educational context, um, I'm convinced that AI will um, be introduced even more in the coming years. Um, and I think it's both definitely an opportunity, but can also pose some risks. Next uh, environment is the home. Uh, I don't know if you can see it uh, on the picture, what I am referring to, but it's the little blue um, uh, sphere that you see on the cupboard. Uh, this is a smart home assistant that includes a virtual voice assistant. And this can be really fun for children. They can ask this virtual voice assistant questions. Um, they can ask it to read stories, to tell jokes. Um, and of course, uh, this is very convenient uh, to uh, receive practical information about the weather, for instance, to receive uh, entertainment uh, content. But at the same time, again, uh, this can also reveal a lot of sensitive information. Uh, imagine that children ask um, questions about... Um, uh, about uh, sexuality, for instance, or about health. Um, it's also very difficult to know how the devices work exactly and what kind of data is used for which purpose. How long is it stored? Uh, there have been some revelations that the information or the requests that are asked to these virtual voice assistants that they are transmitted to um, human reviewers to see how the services can be improved. Uh, but people are often not not aware that this may happen and this is of course um, what is might uh, be uh, quite invasive um, when it comes to uh, the home environment in which people expect a certain degree of uh, privacy. And we see that these virtual voice assistants that are included in smart home assistants but also internet connected toys for instance uh, become more more and more present in, um, in, in many families' home, not that much yet in Belgium, but for instance, in the US, in the UK, um, also in the Netherlands, these devices are becoming very, uh, very popular. Another type of application um, is uh, the use of biometrics. Uh, on the screen, you see an example of facial recognition, but also other types of biometrics of children are increasingly used, uh, such as uh, hand palm scans or iris scans. Um, uh, there are already um, scenarios in the UK where facial recognition is used uh, in the in the lunch room uh, to make sure that the lunch queue is going faster. Uh, so by means of facial recognition, the child can pay for the lunch. Um, but um, uh, this can also be linked, for instance, to allergies. Uh, so by recognizing a child's face, there can be a notice on a screen um, for the people in the canteen that a, a child has certain allergies. So this can um, be, be a positive use, but at the same time, uh, biometrics, use of biometrics, and especially if, it, if it's linked to systems such as facial recognition, can also be really invasive. There are also already data protection authorities who have um, issued decisions on the use of biometrics in school. Um, also in Flanders, there was a school in Ghent that wanted to use a hand palm scan of children to pay for lunch. And there, um, the Flemish um, authority has said that this is disproportionate, that biometrics is, is very intrusive and that um, this is not... Um, a proportionate goal uh, to use this to pay for, um, for lunches. Um, and of course, uh, Stefan already mentioned it in his introduction, we know that so many children and young people are avid users of social media platforms. It can be really beneficial because uh, it's, it's an opportunity to uh, be entertained, uh, to have fun, uh, to, to, um, to watch interesting content. Uh, at the same time, we also know that these platforms um, use um, recommender systems that might offer children uh, the same type of content over and over again. We also know that these recommender systems sometimes have the um, 
the result of presenting or pushing the more extreme content and especially towards children, um, harmful content such as uh, content about eating disorders or self-harm um, can be quite prevalent on these social media platforms. Uh, so this is, of course, again, this story, two sides of the coin. At, 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 on the one hand, very beneficial, um, very entertaining. On the other hand, some um, questions and concerns about how um, the freedom to form your thoughts and the freedom to form your opinion is influenced by the type of content that you get to see on these platforms. And of course, often it's very opaque and very unclear how these recommender systems work and how um, you can change uh, your settings so that that's this, uh, this would perhaps uh, change. Um, Another uh, example is um, uh, a chatbot. So increasingly chatbots for children are uh, being made and uh, being offered. Um, this is, for instance, an example of a travel chatbot. So a chatbot that children can use to plan trips uh, and they can ask the chatbot a lot of questions. Uh, and of course, this can be very informative. But I was quite struck when I um, tried out this uh, travel chatbots. I'm, I'm going to a conference in Paris later this week. Um, and so you can type in the chatbot, yeah, I'm going to Paris. And then the, the, the chatbot offers you um, recommendations. For instance, you can ask the chatbot for restaurants. And then uh, it, for Paris, the first recommendation that you get um, to, to have a nice meal is a restaurant called Breakfast in America. I found it quite striking uh, that you go to Paris and that this is um, this is what the child uh, gets as a recommendation, and then with a with a with an explanation on why the restaurant is recommended. Uh, that actually uh, sometimes uh, a burger is all you want, uh, and. Um, homemade chili corn, which sounds very American to me and uh, not at all uh, French. Uh, so again, very informative, but on the other hand, also depending on the type of content that is offered, um, we might ask some questions. And then a, a final example um, is, of course, in the area of government services uh, and, and uh, algorithms that are used by uh, by public authorities. Um, I don't know if you are aware of, of um, the, the Dutch uh, child care benefit scandal. Uh, this, this is uh, um, uh, something that happened in the Netherlands, uh, the use of an, uh, of an algorithm to try to detect fraud in relation to child benefits. And um, it appeared that um, uh, this led to very uh, discriminatory outcomes. And of course, if, um, if such algorithms are used to decide about things such as uh, childcare benefits, uh, this can have an immediate impact on children. Uh, if, if these AI applications do not work uh, as they should, if they contain, uh, for instance, ethnicity or nationality uh, as a risk factor um, to decide whether or not people uh, receive childcare. This, this is, of course, um, something that directly impacts the child's well-being and um, health. So you see, th these are a few examples, uh, a few types of applications, uh, services, devices that are increasingly present in children's lives. Um, and so I, I think we can safely say that, that today uh, no child is growing up without um, uh, having at least some degree of AI in, uh, in their lives. Of course, these applications and services are still quite recent. And this is also acknowledged at um, the level of different organizations. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a quote from the very recent strategy on the rights of the child that was adopted by the Council of Europe. And it acknowledges that actually today we still know very little about the long-term impact of these types of artificial intelligence systems on children. Uh, we can estimate uh, that or we can think about um, uh, risks and opportunities, but at this moment in time, we still have very little empirical and longitudinal research, uh, very little evidence 
that certain of these applications are either very positive and impact children's development very positively or um, can have a harmful impact. So I think this is uh, definitely uh, one of my messages that um, research into the impact of these services on children is really important. But uh, the, based on what I just mentioned about the opportunities and the risks, what we definitely can do at this moment in time is make the link to children's rights. So in 1989, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted. And this convention stated very clearly that children have rights and that the rights of children should be ensured by governments. And if we think about all the examples that I have now given, uh, I think you can very clearly see the link with some of the rights that I put on the screen. These are, of course, only a selection of rights. Uh, there are many more rights that are included in the convention, but these are some of the rights that can be impacted both positively and negatively by AI applications. So, so for instance, if we think about social media platforms, this is, of course, um, creating a lot of opportunities for the right to freedom of expression. Um, at the same time, we also see the harmful content that is being recommended and being pushed. And this is, of course, um, not, uh, um, not the intention based on Article 17 that requires that children are protected against harmful content. The recommender systems that I was talking about uh, more and more also in the academic community, there are concerns about how these types of recommendation impact freedom of thought. Um, because, of course, the way you form your thoughts and your opinions, this is influenced by the type of information that you receive, uh, information that can come from many sources, uh, from your family, from, from what you learn at school, but also, of course, from what you see on um, online. Uh, so, so this is definitely something that uh, gains more attention uh, over, um, over the past uh, few years and months. Of course, I mentioned a lot of, uh, lot of uh, risks in relation to data, a processing collection of personal data of children from very, very young ages, a data that is sometimes being stored, that is being used to create profiles of children. And these profiles are sometimes used for commercial goals, uh, for um, targeting advertising at them. Uh, so here we have a link to the right to privacy on the one hand and the right to protection from commercial exploitation, uh, which is also included in this Convention on the Rights of the Child. And of course, everything that is related to um, social media platforms, but also video gaming environments, for instance, provides, provides a lot of opportunities for um, the right to play and the right to recreation. But at the same time, also in these video game environments, there can be dark patterns. Uh, so patterns, algorithms that um, let you make certain decisions uh, that are perhaps not um, really that conscious. Uh, conscious. Uh, also, for instance, lead, leading to overspending um, because uh, you are being um, recommended to buy certain uh, premium in-game items. So you see that there are a lot of links that we can make uh, between these AI systems and applications and rights of the child. What you see in the four corners in the white boxes are the four general children's rights principles. And their non-discrimination is, of course, a really important one. But we know that um, algorithms might be biased, uh, might lead to these discriminatory outcomes uh, if uh, there is a certain bias in the training set, in the data set. So this is also something that um, we should definitely be uh, mindful of. The best interest of the child is a guiding principle that always needs to be taken into account uh, when thinking about how um, certain decisions are being made, uh, both at the policy level, uh, but also, for instance, at a school level. 
I will come back to that uh, important principle near the end of um, my presentation. Uh, so, of course, there are other rights that might be affected. Uh, we talked about the right to health, about the right to education. Um, so there are many more rights in the convention that are relevant when um, we think about AI and children. Lately, there has been more and more attention for um, the rights of the child in the digital environment. Um, at the level of the United Nations, the Children's Rights Committee adopted a general comment on the rights of the child in the digital environment uh, last year in March. Because, of course, this convention dates from 1989, so it's already quite old. Uh, not a, none of these technologies were already um, uh, present in, in children's lives. And so the Children's Rights Committee really wanted to offer its views and its interpretation of these rights that are included in the convention in light of all these digital technologies that are now present in children's lives. So it's a very interesting document. If you're interested in this topic, I would really recommend you to read how um, the, the Children's Rights Committee sees uh, children's rights in relation to digital technologies. But they are definitely not the only organization that has uh, paid attention to this issue. The Council of Europe issued a recommendation on this uh, topic uh, already in 2018. The OECD um, adopted the recommendation uh, last year in May 2021. And also at the level of the European Union, the protection of children in the digital and information society has been pointed out as one of the main priorities under the EU strategy on the rights of the child. So this is um, a document that describes how the EU looks at children's rights. They have identified five priority areas and everything that has to do with digital technologies, information society and artificial intelligence included is one of those priorities. So just to give you an idea that this is a topic that has started to um, get more and more attention. And again, in these documents, you always see uh, this attention for both the opportunities and the risks. What, for instance, this document from the Children's Rights Committee says, and I think that that is really important, is that we need to make sure that there is a legal framework. Uh, that we need to review, adopt and update legislation to make sure that this digital environment in which children grow up is compatible with the rights in the convention. And so that is why I would like to briefly look at one of these legislative initiatives that was introduced by the European Commission last year. Um, you, you, you might um, already have heard about um, this proposal for an Artificial Intelligence Act. So this is um, a binding regulation that uh, would be, um, that is proposed by the Commission. And this proposal works on the basis of a um, risk-based system. So it looks at AI systems and it um, assesses the level of risk that a certain system may pose for rights in general, for fundamental rights and values that we consider important in the EU. And so the practices with a very high, high level of risks that we consider unacceptable as a society, these would be prohibited. Then there is another category under that. So if you look at, at the pyramid in, in the orange layer, there are systems that are considered to be high risk. And for those systems, they would be allowed, but there would be quite some requirements that need to be fulfilled if you want to put such a system on the market. The layer below is um, a layer with systems that pose limited risk. So for instance, chatbots are given as one of the examples. For those systems, there would be 
less requirements, uh, but for instance, they would be um, they would need to make it transparent that, for instance, as a user you are as a child that you are talking to a chatbot that this is not a real person answering uh, your questions. And then um, there is also a level or a, a layer of systems that do not pose any risk. I think, for instance, about spam filters. Um, for those type of systems, there would be no requirements. So this is just to give you an idea of how this legislation would work. And of course, what interests me when I look at this proposal is how does this proposal um, look at children? Are children mentioned in this proposal? Um, Yes, they are. Uh, so um, in the preamble of the proposal, it is made clear uh, or it is acknowledged uh, by the European Commission that um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence uh, systems can have a negative impact on a number of fundamental rights. Um, and that the proposal uh, seeks to ensure a high level of protection for these rights and to address uh, the, the, the risks that we uh, see uh, in relation to these AI systems. And so what you see on the screen is a list of rights that are mentioned by the European Commission. And, and in yellow, I have highlighted uh, the rights of the child. So this proposal acknowledges that there might be risks for the rights of the child. And this is even um, emphasized uh, more in detail in one of the recitals to the proposal. Uh, so the, the commission really refers to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, to this general comment number 25 that I have um, talked about in relation to, to uh, one of the previous slides. And so um, this is, an acknowledgement that um, children might be extra vulnerable when it comes to certain AI systems. And this, of course, also leads to some proposals in the actual provisions of um, the regulation. So what is interesting, there are two interesting things in this proposal. One is in relation to these prohibited practices. So these practices that would not be allowed in the EU and uh, there are a few examples, but the one that refers to children is the one that you see on the screen. Uh, so it would be prohibited to um, put on the market an AI system that exploits vulnerabilities of a specific group of, of persons due to their age. So this is a reference to children. Um, and um, this is about systems that would materially distort the behavior of a person. So that would um, encourage uh, people um, to behave differently than they would normally uh, because they are being manipulated, uh, for instance, by an algorithm. And of course, there is an extra condition uh, in order to prohibit such systems. Um, and that is the fact that uh, this uh, system would cause physical or psychological harm. So uh, this is a type of AI system that would not, uh, would not be possible. A second reference to children that we find in this proposal is um, in relation to the orange layer. So the layer with the high risk systems, the proposal does not define high risk systems per se, but in an annex to the proposal, there are some examples that are given, and there are quite some examples that are relevant to children uh, because there is a reference to biometrics. So remember the examples that I gave about uh, using facial recognition in schools. Uh, there are references to education, uh, of course, crucial for children, uh, students, uh, but also the allocation of public assistance, benefits and services. So remember the, the Dutch example about um, the childcare benefit algorithm. So um, there are quite a few high risk systems that can be relevant for children. And what does the regulation propose or what does it say? If you want to put such a system on the market, then you need to um, put in place a risk management system. So this means that you need to look at your system and assess 
whether there are any potential negative impacts for certain rights. And of course, if you identify such risks, you also need to take uh, measures to remedy those risks. And what is interesting is that uh, there is a specific um, reference or a specific requirement that in the context of this risk management system uh, that the provider or the, the, the developer of such a system must give specific consideration to whether this high risk AI system is likely to be accessed by or have an impact on children. Uh, so, so this is um, again an acknowledgement of the fact that certain systems could lead to uh, risks for uh, children and that of of course, measures need to be taken to remedy those risks. So what uh, do we think about this proposal? Um, or what, what is my view on the proposal? I think it's already very positive that the proposal does refer to children, uh, does refer to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, for instance. At the same time, there are still many questions. And this is, of course, only a proposal by the Commission. Now it is going through the legislative process. It needs go to go to the Parliament, to the Council. So a lot can still change. And actually, I hope uh, that it will still uh, change significantly in relation to children, because there are really some doubts about whether or not this Act and the few references to children actually have the potential to ensure that children's rights will be effectively implemented. A second really big problem, I think, and this is a problem in relation to all types of technologies, both for policymakers, but also for the ones who develop the systems, very, very rarely children are consulted in this process. Although the United Nations Convention requires governments to consult children when legislative initiatives are taken that might have an impact on them, this is very rarely done. This was also acknowledged in uh, this very recent strategy of the Council of Europe um, on the rights of the child. Um, so what I think needs to happen is that um, in the process, there still needs to be a more extent, extensive children's rights impact assessment um, that we should really think about um, these prohibited practices. Aren't there other practices that uh, might have a very harmful impact on children that should be prohibited? When it comes to children um, in the children's rights community, we sometimes talk about the precautionary principle. This is a principle that comes from environmental policy. Um, it's kind of a better safe than sorry approach that compels society to act very cautiously if there are certain indications, even if they are not conclusive, that certain practices might have a harmful impact on children. So I think this is something that still needs to be reconsidered. Throughout this process, we need to take the best interests of the child as a guiding principle. Uh, this should outweigh commercial interests, for instance. And last but not least, I really think that children's views must be taken on board, that we must talk to children about how they see AI, how they want to be protected against certain practices, what kind of practices they find unacceptable. And actually, this is why I want to end with a, a quote by the coordinator for the rights of the child of the Council of Europe, a quote that she um, uh, that she mentioned yesterday um, uh, at a child participation conference, because I, read, I really believe that we take children's views way um, too less into account. Children have actually very, very valuable views and insights, especially about these kinds of topics. And I think we might um, uh, have better outcomes, uh, as Regina Jens Dottir says, if we would listen to children more when we are thinking about AI and children and how it should be regulated and how we should talk about it uh, as citizens, as parents, as people who want to ensure that children grow up to be um, uh, valuable human beings. Thank you.